Our purpose is to reduce government control of citizens' lives and return the power to we the people, as declared in U.S. and Florida Constitution. Our mission is to increase citizens' awareness of their constitutional rights. Whenever government abuse of those rights become evident, take peaceful action to remove that abuse. Our goals are to repeal unjust and overreaching laws, be a watchdog of elected officials and judges, to reduce taxes, to take positions on public policy and be a source of information. Our membership is open to all, regardless of your party affiliation. It's open to all who love our country, who honor the Constitution, hold to <coughs> traditional moral values, are fiscally conservative, and believe in service before self. That is the platform of the Northwest Florida Tea Party. I would also like to make you aware that this event is being taped and recorded um, by Ken Nelson and CCTV. You'll be able to go online and see it um, recorded at a later time, and it's being streamed live right now, in fact. Next, let me introduce our moderator for this event. Um, Mike Bates has lived in Northwest Florida since 1989. He manages 1330 AM WEBY, Northwest Florida's talk radio. Mike also hosts a call-in talk show called Your Turn that airs weekday afternoons from 4 PM until 6 PM. Please join me in welcoming Mike Bates, who will then tell us what the rules of the engagement is going to be. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate the opportunity to moderate this evening's event. The rules are as follows. Each candidate will have three minutes to make an opening statement. The order that those statements will be made has been determined by lot. Candidates will have three minutes to respond to my questions. If another candidate's name is mentioned in the response, then that candidate will have a one-minute rebuttal if desired. At the conclusion, each candidate will have three minutes for a closing statement and those will be made in reverse order from the opening statement. Lot determined that Democrat candidate Jim Bryan will make the first opening statement. I'd like to thank everyone for having me here tonight. Uh, my name is Jim Bryan. I'm a resident of uh, Laurel Hill, Florida. I'm born and raised in Paxton, Florida. Uh, my family's been here for several gen generations. I'm, I'm an American Indian. So we've been around a while. But you know, when we look at this district, 73% of this entire district is retired military, active duty, and their dependents. So it's the biggest focus of the entire United States of military might in such a small district. And what I propose is we need representation uh, for the entire district because of that and because of some of the things that bring into the district uh, our military. Uh, my background, at 18 I joined the service. I didn't have to, I was already 4F and uh, they changed my medical and I joined. Uh, that was a decision I made. And I joined the U.S. paratroopers when I left the farm and went into the service with U.S. paratroopers and spent 20 years, a uh, 20 year career. In that 20 year career, I, I had a chance to accomplish some things, quite a few things, if you take a look at my record. And, you know, when I was 19, I never thought that I would make it to 21 in combat. I spent three combat tours in Vietnam, one combat tour in Grenada. And you know, at 19, for our young men to think that they may not make it to B-21, you know, here I am 65, and I'm sitting before you running for Congress. The old saying, do you have skin in the game? When you shed your blood on the battlefield, yes, you have skin in the game. Now, I'm here to serve you. I'm not here to serve any party. I served my country first and foremost. I've proven that in the past, and I'll prove it in the future. So that's why I'm here sitting here today. And I fund my campaign on my retirement. 
That sign you see in the back was bought by Jim Bryan's Army Retirement. That's how I funded my campaign. So please consider, and by the way, the Tea Party has a chance to really make a difference here. And the difference you can make is convince people, are you a branch of the Republican Party? Are you truly independent? Now I have high hopes for the Tea Party because you should be independent. So please uh, consider me November the 6th. Thank you. Mike, if I may, our other candidate has arrived. Um, he had a flat tire. I impress you, it's been repaired, and now he's here. Uh, Mr. William Drummond. All right, our second, our second opening statement will be made by Kaylin Fretz, who is the Libertarian candidate. Is this on? We're getting feedback on the microphones. I don't think this one's on. Do we have somebody in the sound booth that can handle this? Ideally, these speakers would be turned off. That may be the source of the feedback. I'm wondering if it's from this mic here. Turn your off. Because when we tested it before we started, this was not happening. Can I put this back up there? Use our voices and project, but we do need to turn the sound off so that we're at least not having to uh, try to get past that feedback sound. Nothing else. Let's just turn the speakers completely off, and we'll speak loudly. Hey, Jim, will you pass me the microphone? Maybe it, maybe that microphone is doing something. Yeah, Thank you. It's not even on. Hello. Oh, it's not on. Not even on. Yeah. We Passing just go back have to, to be loud. Yeah, I guess so. I've been a herald before. <laughs> we, we can do this without the microphones, but we really need to get the feedback to stop. When the back tire blew. Okay. Kaylin, can you proceed? Should I wait for this to... Yeah, but, but somewhere there's got to be controls in the back for, for the uh, speakers. Because I don't think it's just coming from the two like at the foot of the stage. I can, I can, I've been here for the last few Right. <clears throat> Martin Simmons, I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you're a video guy, not an audio guy, but you know what a soundboard looks like. Do you mind taking a look at that for us? <laughs> Best laid plans, Mike. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I've got a lot of friends in the ship. In fact, I'm looking at the ship in the industrial park. Chip needs jobs badly. Well, you got an empty, you got two empty industrial parks. And that well, he's doing that. that Unplug each one of these, that way at least we know they're not getting any sound. 
That one wasn't even on. Not those. Yours off? It's off. All right, well, all microphones are off, so I don't know what the problem is. But somehow we've got, we've got to get rid of that high pitched tone. It's my fault. I walked up on stage. Nah, it was going before you got here. Oh, okay. It had kind of gone in and out. No, I was thinking maybe this was like uh, down there at uh, the other rally where I was the first person to use the mic and then it didn't work for anyone afterwards. Yeah, I know. It was <laughs> going in and out for me the whole time. And there's one of those mics that if you didn't hold it at just the right angle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I lost all my business because all the other businesses weren't doing anything. You do. Sure. Yeah, oh, you're you're in. In. <laughs> <laughs> I, I trained old school. I was trained in a technical, college, uh, technical school where... Hey! Hey! Uh, you try the mics back on again or no? We try them again? Let's see if you they have nothing to do with the yeah, okay. We'll just do it by. All right. We got so good voice. Mike, do you want us to try the microphones or just project? They, they, they've cut off the mics. We'll okay, we'll that's fine. Project. The room's not that big. We yeah. can project. Exactly. So the second person to make an opening statement tonight is the Libertarian candidate, Kaylin Fritz. Three right. minutes. Good evening. I am Kalen Fretz, and I want to be your congressman, and I want to thank the uh, Northwest Florida Tea Party for providing this unique opportunity. I'm just a concerned citizen. I'm an entrepreneur who loves living in Florida and who wants to raise my family in the same land of opportunity that, that I was blessed with. I'm about better priorities than Congress bribing people with their, own, with their own tax dollars. I can't fix it all by myself, but together we can take the first step. Everyone in this room knows America is in trouble. You can see it in the headlines. You can see it in a sluggish economy. You can feel it in an uncertainty that was never there before. And many of you are wondering if our elected politicians actually believe in the, the principles that made this country great, because you can't see it in their actions. Gas has doubled in price in the last four years, and food is skyrocketing. Jobs are scarce despite the so-called government statistics. Deficit spending, which is more than 10% of our economy over the last four years, has directly caused this disaster. Poor leadership led to this. For years, our Congress has been playing fast and loose with the Constitution, our finances, and the rule of law. Amen. We have a strong republic that can take a lot of abuse, but like a car with no maintenance, it will eventually break down. We're in dire need of an oil change, but for the past decade, our own representative has had a lead foot on the accelerator along with the rest of Congress. Just look at what we've become. At one time, the Bill of Rights was clearly understood to be a limit on government power. Now we have free speech zones and laws, laws where ordinary Americans like you are subject to arrest for protesting your own elected officials at the wrong place and time. The Fourth Amendment apparently no longer applies when Americans travel, and we must submit to de degrading TSA inspections that ought to be considered crimes. Yeah. Recently, medical corporations were given immunity from lawsuits from people like you and I, no matter how harmful their products, just because they got FDA approval. Jeff Miller voted for all of this. Despite his rhetoric, Jeff Miller has shown with his actions over the last 11 years that he believes in big government as long as it's the kind he supports. I'm also sad to say that one rule of law for all is disappearing in this nation. If you or I steal $10,000, we go to jail. But if a banker steals $10 billion, he gets a slap on the wrist and a bonus. Congress is the key. I believe in standing firm on no new debt. I believe in fighting the idea that Government must control and manage us from cradle to grave. I believe in maintaining our liberty instead of trading it for the illusion of security. I believe in free and not centrally planned markets. I believe in political competition. Most importantly, I'm for the rule of law, and I hope you'll support me. Thank you.
third opening statement will be made by Jeff Miller, the Republican incumbent. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to be able to have an opportunity to talk in an honest way about things that are going on in Washington, things that we in Northwest Florida have not liked for a long time. I think the most important thing to look at is, as I got elected a few years ago to the United States Congress, I told you that I was in favor of less taxes, less government, and more personal freedom. You look at websites like Heritage Action and you will see exactly that I am the number one most conservative person in the Florida State Delegation right now. The things that we have done in Washington, and fortunately over the last couple of years, we have received a few uh, folks that help us uh, in response to the overspending that's been going on in Washington. Hey, we did it uh, under the Bush administration, and I say we as Republicans collectively, with about 25 of us, saying no, 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 no. A prescription drug uh, bill that President Bush passed, 25 people said no. I consistently said no on appropriation bills that were passed. I think the thing that we need to focus on today uh, as a country is where do we want to go in the future? Certainly we are looking at the past, uh, what has happened four years under President Obama, uh, with Bill Nelson as our senior United States Senator, without question, things could be a whole lot better. Over the last four years, yes, gas prices have doubled. Yes, food prices have gone up. There's an energy independence need in this country that we can't get the United States Senate to go along with the House in trying to do a all the above strategy to try to bring gas prices down. So working in Congress, with additional members in the House of Representatives that have conservative core ideals and beliefs like I do. Getting a Senate that is controlled not by Harry Reid, but with Republicans that can believe and do the thing that needs to happen. Obamacare cannot be repealed if we don't control the Senate, then certainly we don't have a shot at if we don't have the White House. So the things that we need to do uh, in Washington is to make sure that we control the House, the Senate, and the presidency, and this time, unlike when President Bush was in office, do the right thing. Our fourth opening statement will be made by William Drummond, a write-in candidate. Good evening. Thank you all for having us here. Uh, this is a time for you all to see who we are what we do, what we believe in, and how we might be better, best suited for you. Now, as you can see, I took and wrote a few notes down, but with all that happened to me this evening, I'm not gonna go with this. <laughs> uh, coming here, I had to drive two hours to get here, um, mainly because of distance in the district itself. Uh, it's spread out and on the way I had a flat tire to boot and I had to take and get that fixed to get here. Now, how this can take and relate to what's going on in Washington right now? Well, America's got a bad tire. Several of them. Most of them sit in Congress. They, they don't know how to work together. I mean, the reason why I took and started running for office to begin with is because I turned on C-SPAN one day to see the debates on how they were going to create jobs in this country. Instead, what did I get to see? I got to see a bunch of men and women acting like toddlers on a playground fighting over a toy. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. They had no idea on how to take and work together to get the job done. We need people in Congress who are willing to work with one another, who are willing to see the bigger picture, to be able to stand up for American for, for all Americans. I mean, rich, poor, middle class, businesses, it doesn't matter. Every single person in America needs fair representation, and right now in Congress, we don't have that. And the, all the people that I've talked to, they believe the same thing. They think that half the people, or more, shouldn't even be there up on the hill. They have no idea what it is to actually be out on the front lines, so to speak, they, they don't know how to deal with these hardships. They've never had to deal with these hardships. It's time that we make sure that Congress is changed because if we change Congress, 
then we are going to see a more prosperous future for all of us, for not only this district, but in this entire, this, the entire country. Um, another thing about uh, many of the congressmen that are in office, they've been in there for several terms. They, they get set in their ways. You need to change them out. Now, like Robin Williams said, uh, babies and uh, congressmen they have the same problem. They need to be changed from time to time. So that is why I'm running. I want to be able to work for you, to be your voice and your representative up on the Hill. Thank you. Jeff Miller, have the rights of American citizens expanded, reduced, or remained about the same under such laws as the Patriot Act and the National Defense Authorization Act? Please explain the basis for your answer. Uh, clarify uh, where in the National Defense Authorization Act you speak. It's a pretty big bill. Well, it is a pretty big bill. Um, specifically, the allegation that a citizen can be detained without warrant and without the right to habeas corpus. Okay, I'll be glad to speak about those uh, two issues particularly. Uh, the Patriot Act, uh, of which I supported and continue to support, uh, the thing that our Congress is charged with by the Constitution is protecting the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Making sure that we have the capability using today's tools and technology is critical. Things are much different today when you talk about using a telephone with a simple landline, whereas you use today cell phones that are disposable. It's a whole lot different to be able to take care of people that are using disposable cell phones. There has been a lot of discussion about the National Defense Authorization Bill uh, in regards to it uh, somehow being interpreted to say that you can uh, keep American citizens indefinitely. It doesn't say that. Uh, in fact, it specifically says you can't do that. And a court just recently has said that they believe that that is true. Uh, just a couple of days ago, a court has upheld uh, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, that's what we do in Washington. We pass laws, and it is the court's responsibility to go through and determine whether or not they in fact are constitutional. And there is a question by some as to whether it is or it isn't. That solution is going to be made in the courts. That's exactly where it should be made. And I can assure you one thing. This member of the United States Congress would never vote knowing that something was specifically unconstitutional. We had colloquies on the floor which specifically talked about whether or not you could, in fact, keep somebody indefinitely in detention. So I don't subscribe to that theory. Uh, I say that, in fact, the National Defense Authorization Act, which has been passed every year for the last 49 years, and it is what our Defense Department needs in order to, offer, to operate. Jim Bryan, what is your opinion of the pa Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act commonly referred to as Obamacare, and should it be implemented as is, should it be modified, or should it be repealed? Uh, I feel that it should be modified. Uh, keep in mind, I still have three kids at home. Uh, my 26-year-old daughter has no coverage, none whatsoever. I'm pretty fortunate. You know, I'm a retired military. A lot of you are probably, you know, show of hands, how many's on TRICARE here? Okay, it's a good chunk. You're not too concerned about the Affordable Health Care Act. But when you have no insurance whatsoever, now affordable health care means, I'll give you an example, a lady that I know pays $1,700 a month for her insurance policy. She had had breast cancer four years before and they booted her off of one policy, she goes on to another. You know, we have to have affordable health care. TRICARE is fine, yes. But we need affordable health care. And how do you get it? Uh, there's several ways you can get affordable health care. And, you know, I brought an example here too. This disc 
costs three hundred dollars to Medicare. The same disc, the VA pays fifty-six dollars. There's no competition with the Medicare. There is competition in the VA system. Same with this inhaler. Inhaler is fifty-six bucks. The VA pays nineteen dollars. Medicare pays. 50, I think $59 for the same inhaler. You know, I could go on and on and on in our health care system. I brought two bills. <clears throat> this is a blood test. This standard blood test, a local hospital charged $2,600 to TRICARE. Sacred Heart charged $39 for the same blood test. Affordable health care means affordable health care. And how we get it is monitoring what some of these hospitals and hospital corporations do and what they charge. You know, health care has gone wild. There's no controls on it. That's why $300 for this. And the, the Congress voted the Drug Care Act for Medicare to be non competitive. I believe uh, Representative Miller was speaking on that earlier. We've got to have competition. And in Congress, that's what I would do. I would seek out and look at all these avenues where these drug, drug you know, the, the drug companies, pardon me, finish. Yeah. Out of time. Kaylin Fretz. The national debt exceeds $16 trillion and is growing by more than $1 trillion every year. How can we reduce that debt, and what would you do to balance the budget? Well, that's a great question. <clears throat> over the past four years, Obama, President Obama, has run up over $5 trillion in debt. And we all realize this is going to uh, cripple our economy. It's, it's already having de devastating effects on our economy. It's already devaluing our dollar, devaluing our way of life. The thing is, a bipartisan Congress has enabled that. Congress is who holds the purse strings, it's not the President. Congress makes these decisions to raise the debt limit. They've been doing it for, for, for 11 years now. In fact, over the past 11 years, we've had the debt raised over $5 trillion. And you can guess who voted for that $5 trillion. In fact, $2 trillion of that alone, more than $2 trillion of that, was voted for just last year. In the same vote, they created the Super Committee. Didn't the Super Committee work out great? Let's give all our decision-making ability to a group of 12 people to decide for us to, to, to do our job. Let's abdicate our authority to a group of 12 people to decide how to uh, cut the budget. And uh, of course, the, the, the debt went up $2 trillion. And part of that uh, vote was the sequester also called the, the fiscal cliff. Now, in the fiscal cliff, what we're seeing is a devastating impact to a lot of our military, uh, current military and veterans. Well, now we have congressmen that are complaining that the sequester is affecting the veterans. The same, very same congressmen that voted for the $2 trillion debt limit increase, that voted for the super committee, that voted for the, the sequester in the first place. Now that's the height of hypocrisy, if you ask me. Yeah. So I would ask you, we hear talk about how we have to have Republicans controlling Congress, and the big picture, what's the difference between Obama and a Republican if they're both going to vote for over $5 trillion in debt? That's my question. Now, the great thing about America is that we prevailed in spite of the Congress's policies, not because of them. Let's talk about what else uh, we've gotten here in, in the last 11 years with our Congress. Talked about the unconstitu Unconstitutional Super Committee. Let's talk about the NDAA for a second. You were just told that the NDAA doesn't apply to citizens. That's a lie. Yeah. And I, I maybe shouldn't use the L word, but it is. If I take out a $20 bill and a $5 bill and a $1 bill, and I tell you, you can choose any of these. You can. You can take the, the 20, the 10, or the 1. You can take any of them, but you're not required to take the $20 bill. 
What are you probably going to take? The $20 bill. Even though the, bill, even though the National Defense Authorization Act says you're not required to detain, detain American citizens, it says you're allowed to. Don't sacrifice your liberties in the name of security. Jeff Miller, you were not... Jeff Miller, you were not specifically mentioned by name, but it was clear he was referencing you. Would you like a minute? I didn't. No, no, no. The rules were by name. The rules were by name. Well, actually, I was called a liar, which I'm not. <laughs> and I will tell you that it specifically says in the law that American citizens cannot be indefinitely detained. We may have a disagreement as to how somebody wants to interpret it, and that's fine. That's what the courts are for. That's what the judicial branch is supposed to do. But I don't intend to call anybody on this stage a liar, and I don't appreciate being called a liar. That's what President Obama just did to Mitt Romney after Mitt Romney kicked him up one side and down the other in the debate a couple nights ago. Doesn't know the facts, so wants to call people a liar. <coughs> Will you respond to that? that? He didn't I didn't mention anybody. He was, he was referring to me in his response. Kayla, we, we will be as fair as we can possibly be in this All debate, right. I assure you. William Drummond, do you support term limits for U.S. representatives and senators? Why or why not? Actually, I do believe that there should be term limits on senators and congressmen. Uh, originally, both offices were seen as temporary jobs for people to be able to better serve their country, better serve their area and be a fair representation of who there is in America. You'd have tradesmen, doctors, scientists, farmers, people off the street. Anyone in this country can be a congressman or a senator. And that's the way our founding fathers made it. They wanted to make sure that everyone had the right to be fairly represented in Congress. Otherwise, you wind up with what was going on between the colonies and England. They weren't being represented fairly, and that's what led to all the trouble. I think that it also fosters a better exchange of ideas between people. It allows new ideas and new faces to rotate in and out of Congress and the Senate, which would allow for less stagnation and more cooperation between all parties involved. Jeff Miller, the military is a big part of the economy in the first congressional district of Florida. <clears throat> the automatic budget cuts, known as sequestration, that are scheduled to kick in in January, would reduce Department of Defense spending by nearly a half trillion dollars over the next decade. How would such budget cuts affect military readiness overall, and how would it affect this congressional district specifically? The president has already said that under sequestration we would not in fact see an effect on personnel. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, in regards to pay for our military, health care for our military. But we will in fact, should sequestration kick in, uh, see an effect on platforms, airplanes, ships. Uh, we'll also see uh, potential uh, problems with installations around not only the United States but around the globe as well. But I will tell you something. The defense side was put into uh, the debt deal in August of last year as a way to try to force an agreement. An agreement that unfortunately could not be reached again because the only thing that the Senate wants to do is raise taxes. That is not the solution to the problem that we have in Washington today. The problem that exists is that Washington spends too much of your money. Taxes are not the problem. Nobody should raise your taxes one penny while we cannot get spending under control. And if we can't do that between November and January in the lame duck session, then we will have sequestration kick in. It's not just defense. There are a lot of other issues that are going to be focused on as well. Education dollars, housing dollars, other things that folks are relying on, whether or not the federal government is supposed to be providing them or not, is not the issue. Is that they do, in fact, rely on them right now. So sequestration may very well become 
uh, to life on the 1st of January. Jim Bryan, Social Security consumes about 20% of the federal budget. Medicare consumes about 23% of the federal budget. Combined, that's 43%, and it will grow significantly as baby boomers age. What changes, if any, would you make to these programs? Well, one of the big things, we're talking about billions of dollars in lost revenue because of just what I said previously. When Just multiply this by the need with our senior citizens. Some of our senior citizens are on 10 different medications. And in Medicare, if there's no competition, look how much money that is. I'm on Medicare, okay? I'm 65. My Medicare is $100 a month. That's what I pay for my Medicare Part A and B. Now, if we get competition into the system, and not only that, wellness programs. You know the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Now, my, my take is let's get more wellness uh, programs into the system where people have their blood pressure checked, their sugar check regularly, they have mammograms, they have uh, PAPs, they have whatever they need preventive. Let's get the prevention out there so we can have a wellness uh, system in, you know, in the Medicare. Not only that, in our general health care altogether. Wellness programs. You know, one of my pet peeves is school lunch. You know, it's not healthy. You know, back when I was a kid, we got, uh, you know, the five uh, pyramid food groups for your school lunch. Today, they feed our kids pizza. We've got fat kids. You know, I've got one myself. You know, he's, he runs track now to knock off a few pounds. We have to take care of our youth. And by taking care of our youth, we take care of our seniors. And uh, I'm not satisfied at all with, with the, the direction Medicare goes in and how our seniors are treated. We've got to have a better system. Us as the most wealthiest nation in the world, we have to take care of our people more. You know, uh, I'm American Indian. I'm an American Indian warrior. And part of the code of a warrior is you take care of the children, you take care of your elderly, and you take care of your nation. This is my nation, okay? And we've got to do a better job of that. And in Congress, that's one thing I will be doing, is pushing for wellness programs through the Medicare system and the Medicaid, as well as general health uh, altogether. Thank you. Kaylin Fretz, what are your views on China as a trading partner, as a creditor, and as a potential military adversary? Well, that's an important question. I think the number one issue with China from our perspective is the national debt. Uh, we owe trillions and trillions of dollars to China. We're now borrowing at a rate of 43 cents on the dollar from countries like China. This does not enable our national security. In fact, this threatens our national security. <clears throat> Children are born into this country $50,000 in debt now. That's unbelievable. You know, I, I plan to have children here in probably in the next few years, and I can't imagine them being born into maybe $75,000 in debt and less and less freedoms. Now, <clears throat> so about the debt, we, we have to stop, stop borrowing from China. We have to stop borrowing from other countries immediately. We have to stop running up the debt. We have to stop using our, our, our uh, children's future as the nation's credit card. Now, as far as the military adversary, that's an interesting question as well. Uh, we know that uh, China and Russia are uh, alongside Iran a lot of the time. So that may be a possibility. However, the United States spends more on military defense than the next 10 countries combined. That includes China, that includes Russia, that includes eight other countries. So I don't think the problem is military spending. I think we spend plenty. The problem is making sure that we spend the money in a good way. Now just this in the past year, the Navy requested that uh, Congress 
give them money for nine Navy destroyers. So Congress said, that's not enough. The Navy doesn't know how, ma how many destroyers they need. We'll give them 10. So that was an extra billion dollars that was spent. And guess who that money was probably borrowed from? China. Let's stop borrowing from China and threatening our own national defense in the name of defense. We have to stop doing it right now. $5 trillion over the past 11 years threatens our national security. It's the number one issue. It's going to enslave our children to other countries. Stop it. William Drummond, would you like to see our foreign aid budget increased, decreased, or remain the same? That's actually a tough question because some countries actually do need aid, but not all of them. I, I feel that we're taking and supporting countries that can do quite well without us. Uh, I don't see why we're spending all the money on them when we could take those same funds and apply it to programs here or even to help reduce the deficit. We need to take care of our own house first before we start trying to meddle in someone else's. Um, that, that's how we keep getting in all these conflicts and wars. That's why we keep getting terrorists threatening us is because a lot of times we're just meddling in things and not really seeing the consequence before we even do it. If a country needs aid, they should ask us. If they are well off then, and they need military aid, well then, the way I see it, we're being their police force and they should be paying taxes for those police. There's, there's no other way to take care of the cost and the problems that are going on. If a country says we need military aid and they've got billions of dollars to spend, let them foot the bill, yes, we'll help them out. But just handing them cash, handing them resources, and not expecting anything in return, especially when we can use those same things here at home to grow jobs, to fix roads, to instruct teachers, to make better systems all around, I just don't see why we're doing it. Jeff Miller, do you think President Barack Obama has overstepped his constitutional authority in any manner? If so, what should be done about it? Well, I certainly believe signing Obamacare uh, was something that was unconstitutional. Unfortunately, our United States Supreme Court uh, has said that it was not. The interesting thing about the debate uh, in regards to Obamacare uh, was that it's considered a tax, not a penalty. It was never discussed as a tax in any of the debates on the floor in the House or in the Senate. And today, senators, the Democrat senators in particular, will continue to tell you that it's not, in fact, a tax. I think the thing that we need to focus on, we talked talk about China just a second ago. Uh, not only is the debt that China holds critical, but we released a report yesterday in regards to Huawei and ZTE, which are two mega communication firms that China has that are trying to get a foothold into the United States of America. It's not just the fact that they would be in the communication business, but also the hardware, the switching boxes, the cables, and everything that needs to happen in order to make communications work. Now, they claim that they're just like AT&T and Bell South and all the others, but they're not. They have not been transparent. So not only do they attempt to hack public computers, government computers every single day, thousands of times they try to hack the Department of Defense every single day. But now they're trying to do it through economic reasons. And let me tell you about the ships within our own Navy. Our own United States Navy has a master list of the ships that we need. They say we need over 300 ships in our Navy. We have 280. So they are not even funding their own requirement list. And it's important that if they won't do it from the Obama administration standpoint, somebody has to do it so the United States, in fact, can be defended on the waters that exist today. Jim Bryan. President Obama is calling for tax increases on the wealthiest Americans. He says that they need to pay their, quote, fair share. 
What do you think is a fair tax rate for high income earners, and do you support the graduated income tax system? I do support the graduated income tax system. Uh, however, you know, there's other ways to, to skin this cat. You know, we talk about stimulus. Boy, everybody hates that word. But let me tell you about stimulus. And when I mean stimulus, I mean wages. You know our wages here, how, you know, I have kids. My kid, uh, working his way through college, worked at Tom Thumb. He made seven sixty an hour. Seven sixty an hour, okay? His supervisor was making nine dollars an hour and he's a college professor teaching two courses online. He had three jobs, okay? Now, those jobs are, are part-time, they're temporary, with no benefits whatsoever. And that's what happens with these companies. They get cheap labor, and they get cheap labor from us. Now, in, in the taxing, how you get taxes is you pay a living wage. A living wage is where a family can have a kid, have a car, a cheap trailer, pay rent, or maybe build a house, okay? One thing that I did uh, in the past is I helped recruit companies, manufacturing companies, for an industrial park. I'm very proud of that. The wages that company paid when it came into that park started off at 14 an hour. Manufacturing, manufacturing, manufacturing. We have the ideal situation here along I-10. We have three ports, we have CSX, we have I-10, okay? It's perfect for manufacturing. Yet, everybody's selling wings on the beach, bikinis, nine bucks an hour. You know, that's what our kids have to look forward to. And what I stress and push is to bring back manufacturing back to the United States and start building these industrial parks. This little part right here that I brought as an example is a copy made in China. Cost 200 bucks. It's in all of your air conditioners, okay? The American made part lasts indefinite. The Chinese part lasts about six months. Then it catches fire like this one did. The guy that changed it said, hey Jim, I'm gonna put an American made part in there and I, we had no trouble. You know, China, getting back to that, and this gets into the taxing, a Jeep Grand Cherokee in China cost $186,000 for a Chinese national. Balance of trade, we have no balance of trade. And that goes hand in hand with revenue and taxing. Thanks. Kalen Fretz, in this world of terrorist threats, is there a point when Americans should give up some constitutional liberties in the name of security? Well, that's an important question because unfortunately Congress has been voting to give up our liberties for 10 years now. Uh, and that's what makes this, what, that's what uh, threatens our security. This country was created, our founding fathers had a vision for this country that our rights did not come from the government. That was revolutionary back in 1776. Before that, government gave people gave the, their citizens rights. In 1776, the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, and, and those great minds said, we have, to, we have to flip the role. We have to say, we the people give the government the right to govern, but we retain all the rights that we don't specifically give them. In Article 1, Section 8, we give the Congress 17 specific duties, enumerated powers, and uh, the Bill of Rights, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, specifically state that any powers not given to the federal government will uh, stay with the states or the people. Now, the Bill of Rights also in the Fourth and Fifth Amendments says that United States citizens uh, are, are free from government interference without a warrant. It says the government has to get a warrant to listen to your phone lines, to look at your bank records. Well, the Patriot Act said never mind the Fourth Amendment because there's terrorists. So don't worry about the Fourth Amendment. We need to wiretap your phones. We need the records for your own safety. Now look, look back throughout history. Look what all tyrannical governments have done. 
Throughout time, as, when the government is, is, is started, it usually started through a revolution because people cast off the chains from the previous government and say, we want our liberty back. But over time, people become complacent and the government grows and grows and gets its foot in the door and takes your liberties inch by inch. And that's what our government's doing right now. And over the past 10 years, they've accelerated that. They've slammed the door open and said, now in this NDAA bill, the pres President Obama can detain American citizens without a trial. And if you think that's not the truth, go listen to uh, senior Senator uh, Republicans John McCain and Lindsey Graham debating this on the floor of the Congress, and you'll hear straight out of the horse's mouth that this darn sure does apply to American citizens. We have to stop it right now before it gets really bad. Okay? In my remaining time, let's talk about military drones inside the U.S. Do you believe that the military should be able to use drones inside the U.S.? Some of your Congress does, that's for certain. Uh, let's talk about No Child Left Behind. Doubled the uh, size of the uh, Department of Education. This was back in 2001. Your Congress voted for that, despite claiming to be conservative. Ronald Reagan talked about uh, decreasing the size of the education. In fact, I would like to eliminate the Department of Education. We need to get them out of our lives, out of our schools, and go back to the private school systems the churches and charities that made this country great, government did not make, make this country great, people did. Amen. William Drummond, what role should the federal government have in education? Well, the way the role is right now is not working. Uh, everything's geared toward the test. Uh, they're looking at test numbers. Test numbers, test numbers, test numbers. That's the only thing you hear from them. What about art? What about science? What about math? What about drama, literature? Uh, there is so much that there goes into education that's more than just test scores. And it's been shown, proven, that both music and art, as a part of a high school or any kind of curriculum, will take and make test scores better. So if you're worried about test scores, Put the programs back in that you slashed out because you felt that, the, that we were spending too much on American people. I'm sorry, but uh, if we don't take and educate our children, then our country has no future whatsoever. If you take and say, oh, I'm sorry, but you can't have that art class because we're afraid that it's going to take and take a bullet away from a soldier, well, guess what? If you don't take and pay for that art class, then what you are going to reap is a bunch of idiots who don't know how to do anything in this country. You don't have to go to college to be able to know how to do a job. You, people can get educated on the job. Corporations and government have seemed to ignore that fact. They, they require you to have college educations. Trade schools. Trade schools are a wonderful way for a person to be able to get ahead. I myself am a tradesman. I'm a certified commercial artist. Do you know what that gets me? Bupkis. They say, where's your piece of paper? Oh, I love how much you can do. I love your portfolio. I love all the experience. But I can't hire you because you don't have a college education. We have more jobs in this country that can't be filled because everyone requires that stupid piece of paper. And if everyone requires that piece of paper, how in the world are they going to get those people? They're not going to get them from American citizens, not unless you take and make sure that teachers are able to teach children what they need to be able to work in this country. Teaching a person how to fill in a circle on a test is nothing. Uh, and what happened to handwriting in this, in, in the, in this country? Sorry. I'm a trained calligrapher. I know how to write. I know how to paint. I know how to take something bland and make it beautiful and at the same time make it relevant. You take a look at kids' handwriting today, they haven't been taught the basics at all. It's chicken scratch. And you expect them to be able to excel? We need better education. All right, I've got lots more questions, but not enough time to get answers to them. So let's move to the closing statements, which will be done in reverse order from the opening statements. 
So, uh, William Drummond, if you will give the first closing statement, you have three minutes. Thank you. Like I said, I'm honored to be here tonight and happy to be able to talk with you all. Like I said, this is a chance for you all to see who we are. I already told you why I'm running for Congress, but another reason is I've lived in the area for over 20 years. I've been married for 22, and I've raised an autistic son by myself and with my wife at home. Um, and I've seen factories close, schools lose money, people dropping out. We see storefronts with for sale signs all over them, people getting laid off. Well, unless you take and make sure that people are working, none of that's going to change. If people are working, well, guess what? They're buying goods. If they're buying goods, then they're creating a demand for more work. If we want to turn this country around, we have to get people back to work. We have to make sure that they're well educated and that they can take and go into the workforce. It's, it's not because they don't want to work. Everyone wants to be able to make a, a wage, a living. But if you don't give them the opportunity, then what's America really about? Is it even America at all if we don't have people who are willing to do something about it? Like I said, I want to be your representative and your employee in Washington to be able to, to represent you and your values and your ideas and your concerns. So if you'd like to see more about me, you can go to my website, drummondforcongress.org, drummondforcongress.org. Thank you. I'm, may I might also add on election day, please write my name in as William Cleve Drummond II. Thank you. Jeff Miller, you have three minutes. Again, I want to say thank you to everybody for being here tonight. And I want to start off by saying I don't believe that there's a person here on this stage that doesn't believe that America is the greatest country on the face of this earth. We've got different ways that we want to look at how we solve those issues that are out there. And that's what you as the folks that are charged with re-electing or electing members of Congress are supposed to do. Work through the information that was provided tonight. Go to websites. Try to become educated. One of the things that I think any of us here would agree is not enough people take the time to learn about the candidates where they are, what they've done, what their record is. I stand here tonight telling you I'm proud of the record that I have in the United States Congress. I'm proud of what I've done for the first congressional district. Since the time that I came to Congress, I focused on two major things, and that has been our Armed Services Committee and also the Veterans Affairs Committee. And now I've risen to the full chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee. With almost 130,000 veterans in the 1st Congressional District, it's my responsibility that we keep the promise to those men and women who have worn the uniform, those that have borne the battle, their widows and their orphans, the children and the families of those that have served in the United States. I've been to Iraq 12 times, Afghanistan as many times, visiting with our men and women doing what we as a nation have asked them to do, and that's defend freedom. We owe it to them to keep the promise that we made to each and every one of them. I will tell you this, a $16 trillion debt in the United States of America is a debt that we cannot afford. If we were paying the interest that we actually should be paying right now, this country would have a very tough time paying for our debt. But I will tell you this, given a Congress that has conservative ideals and beliefs, unlike what we have now in the United States Senate and also in the White House, we can bend that curve down. People like my friend, Paul Ryan, who's the chairman of the Budget Committee, has in fact done the work that needs to be done to bend the curve downward, to make a difference in spending in Washington. The two biggest things that we have to focus on, certainly, 
our Medicare and Social Security. If we don't deal with those two issues, nibbling around at the edges, we're not going to solve the major problems that exist in this country. I'm Jeff Miller, and I humbly ask for your vote to return to Washington as your United States Congressman. Caitlin Frex, you have three minutes. Well, <clears throat> one of the beautiful features of our republic is every two years you get to clean house in Congress. Our representative is on the wrong path. He talks of improving the, uh, the economy, but continuously enables enormous increases in debt. Yeah. He talks of defending the Constitution and liberty, but votes against both. He claims to be a defender of the military and veterans, but at best it's short term. His approach threatens defense in the long run because it threatens our way of life. A strong national defense is based on economic strength. There's nothing conservative or responsible in perpetual debt and sacrificing our natural rights at the altar of government. In your own self-interest, it's time to clean house in Washington. Amen. Tonight you've heard a lot of talk, but it's actions that count, and 11 years of actions in D.C. speak volumes. I'd like you to go home with one thought in mind. Don't, he don't heed my opponent's message. The real message is this, you should be afraid of ending government meddling in health care and the economy. You should be afraid of not getting government favors anymore. You should be afraid of ordinary people deciding how to run their own lives. You need to be dependent. I refuse to live in fear. I ask you to join me, and you can stop being afraid when you know your rights will be defended, not abused by our government. That there is truly a free market instead of a centrally planned one. The government is kept on a leash and that there's one rule of law for all. It's these priorities that made America great and it's these priorities that will let us find a better way and restore America again. Now there may be those who will say this election's a waste of time. Let's just go with more of the same and everything will be all right. But I don't like attitudes like that. They make us settle for less. We deserve better and we must have better. We must right the ship and we must do it now, not in two more years and who knows how much more debt and who knows how much less liberty. I want to thank my beautiful wife and my family for being here tonight for this event. Uh, I want to thank the congressman for saying the debt should stop and I want to encourage him to stop voting for so, so much of it. And uh, lastly, I would ask you how many veterans fought for mountains of debt, less freedom and endless war. I would say none. Please visit Fretz for Congress for more info. Don't take it anymore. I ask for your vote in November and thank you for your time. Jim Bryant, you have three minutes. Well, you know, I started off on this in 2007 because I felt that we had to start to get together in Congress as a nation. You know, I could take my paratroopers and I could move a mountain with teaspoons. But you know, I see few paratroopers in Congress. When our service members can do more than Congress can do, you know, we need more of us in Congress. We need more service members in there. We need more combat veterans in there. You know, a combat veteran will not vote for war unless it's absolutely necessary. You know, the things that I've seen at 18 and 19 years old, there's no way. You know, we've got to be able to have a working Congress. Right now, Congress's approval rating is about 10%. I think the bubonic plague is 12%. You know, <laughs> we've got to have a break here. And a break is, you know, I was a weapons test manager. I had a top secret clearance. I was a nuclear weapons tactical expert. We had to have a team to do these things. You know, Congress is supposed to be a team. And, and I've said over and over, I don't serve a party. I serve a nation. And I've served a nation before for a long period of time. So when I step forward, I don't step forward but for one thing, and that's to serve this nation and to serve you. 
There's, there's an old saying, it's not that old, but you know, I was a member of what they call the Geronimos. And guess who I had with me? A young second lieutenant was one of my lieutenants. His name was David Petraeus. We were on a parachute jump one night, and he said, Sergeant Brian, I got your back. I was the jump master. I had to turn around and he had to check my static line because I was the jump master. I put everybody out. David Petraeus had my back. I've got your back, but do you have mine? Now, this election is coming up November 6th, and you have to decide, are you going to vote straight party ticket, or are you going to pick an individual? You got me if you want me. You got me to fight for you if you want me. My job in the military and after I retired was to accomplish things, get things done. They call me the fixer in the military. I set two world records parachuting. Fact check, it's on my Facebook and in my record. I did that because they said it couldn't be done and it hadn't been done. I'm running for Congress now because they told me there's no way I could run against Mr. Miller and win. I am. But I'm here to serve. Thank you. Mike, would you like to say anything before we close? I just want to say, why don't we all give them, everyone, a big round of applause. to run for office and I appreciate them even doing so. I want to recognize some elected officials we have in the audience. Uh, Count, uh, Commissioner Wilson Robertson. <laughs> David Morgan. <laughs> Looks like Mayor Ashton Hayward had to leave a little earlier. We have some candidates in here who are running for office. Not only Commissioner Wilson and David Morgan who are, uh, will be on the ballot, but I see Mike Whitehead also in the audience here. And I want you all to, uh, my thanks and appreciation to you for coming out this evening, uh, for making yourself informed. Our purpose here today was not to tell you who to vote for, but to give you information so you know yourself and make your own decision. Good night, everyone, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.